I am Dr. Om Lakhani and uh, good evening to uh, the moderators today, uh, Dr. Sarita Ma'am uh, and Dr. R. Srinivasan and uh, good evening ma'am. So uh, the flow of this uh, session would be that I'd be presenting uh, one major case and two small ones uh, and that end of it, you know, we'll discuss a little bit of review and then we'll, uh, you know, open it for discussion with the uh, moderators today. So uh, the talk today is on Hashimoto's encephalopathy uh, and we'll be discussing some cases. Uh, but the appropriate term for this disease is actually steroid responsive encephalopathy with autoimmune thyroiditis. Now I'll spend a minute trying to kind of dissect this terminology and you'd often say what's in the name. Well, if it, this name had nothing to do with Hashimoto's, uh, in fact, you know, the uh, original Japanese scientist ha has nothing to do with disease at all. You know, it pro probably did not even know that this disease existed uh, in his time. Uh, this, this is a term which, which came at a later date in 1966 to be precise. Uh, and the second important thing we have to understand is that uh, we need to, you know, as endocrinologists, we cannot confuse between the term encephalitis and encephalopathy. Right? So encephalopathy is a broad terminology meaning any or any disease of the brain, whereas encephalitis specifically talks about inflammation of the brain. So the correct terminology here to use is Hashimoto's encephalopathy and not Hashimoto's encephalitis. And even more appropriate would be the term which is steroid responsive encephalopathy with autoimmune thyroiditis. So I'll first I'll present the first case and this is that of a 30 year old female uh, who is a medical doctor herself. Uh, she has no significant past history and the patient started having subacute episodes of transient loss of consciousness uh, starting from July 2021 and this were associated with confusion and disorientation. So this is what the patient described. Now initially uh, they were thought to be vasovagal uh, syncope uh, as per the clinical notes which we saw and uh, however she had a history of focal seizures uh, with loss of consciousness so par uh, you know uh, uh, complex partial seizures. Uh, and confusion in August 2021. So this was the index event which brought her to the specialist attention. Now at that point of time in August 2021 an evaluation was done and there was no significant finding on neuroimaging. So the MRI was more or less normal. The EG showed some non-specific changes. Uh, there was no other secondary cause of seizures and uh, there was no, nothing else reported in the EG. Uh, no thyroid function test was done at that point of time. However, on retrospective questioning, when we saw this patient, the patient did complain of weight loss and there were some fine tremors. And with this index events of seizure, uh, the patient and this, uh, you know, the other history, the patient was at that point of time, uh, started on levitiracetam. Now, this, at this point of time, the patient was not seen by us. Uh, the patient was evaluated in another uh, institution. So when the patient was followed up, she was seizure free for uh, almost two months, but it should, did complain of some memory loss and some occasional headaches. Uh, however, the second event occurred in, uh, uh, you know, with seizures and loss of consciousness again in November 2021. And then that is the time she came to our attention and that point of time she was admitted and then she was re-evaluated completely. Now at this point of time, of course, the patient was under care of a neurologist. Uh, they did a CSF. Uh, we did not show anything significant uh, except for a mild increase of CSF protein. There was clearly no evidence of meningitis to consider. Uh, again, there was no significant finding again on neuroimaging, which was again repeated and there was nothing there to speak of. Uh, very importantly, the neurologist uh, did an autoimmune encephalitis panel, which was negative. This was very important, uh, as we'll see in the discussion also. And what is interesting is that how the patient actually came to the attention of an endocrinologist was that a thyroid function test was done and to everyone's surprise, uh, well, perhaps should not be surprised looking at the history, the patient had thyrotoxicosis, right? So then, uh, of course, you know, our endocrinologist was called in and at this point of time, we, uh, you know, uh, did further investigations. We did a technetium 99 per technetic uh, thyroid scan, which showed a diffuse increase uptake. Uh, along with that, a TSH receptor antibody was also done which was also strongly positive. We also sent an NT-TPO antibody, uh, you know, uh, which also was strongly positive. So uh, this is the evaluation from a thyroid perspective. These are the other lab reports. And uh, you can see the uh, thyroid function test. Uh, you know, this is uh, where 3T4 was on a follow-up. So, uh, you know, 
sorry, uh, the 3 T3 was elevated, the 3 T4 was uh, more or less normal. So mainly T3 toxicosis, TSH was uh, reduced. Uh, NTTP was strongly positive, NTTG antibody was also positive. There was a very interestingly mild elevation of SCPT and SCOT. Now, you know, why this is important? Well, I don't really know, but you know, if you see some case series, uh, in patients with Hashimoto's encephalopathy, uh, you know, encephalopathy, there have been uh, mild liver elevations which have been reported uh, as the thyroid scan was uh, as, as described and the paraneoplastic antibody panel was also negative along with autoimmune encephalitis panel which was negative. So at this point of time, we made a provisional diagnosis along with the neurologist to consider a diagnosis of Hashimoto's encephalopathy with Graves disease. Now, we wanted to really know, you know, whether there is a coexistence of Graves disease or this is a completely different, uh, you know, two different diseases presenting the same patient. And we did a review of literature and there were about 20 cases of Graves disease with Hashimoto's encephalopathy, which have been reported. Uh, these are some of these cases, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, just uh, point them out. So there have been cases reported of similar condition in the past. So based on this clinical presentation, we started the patient on glucocorticoids uh, for the Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Along with that, the patient was started on carbimazole for the uh, thyrotoxicosis of the Graves disease and beta blockers. The patient was given one gram of intravenous methyl prednisolone for three days, followed by oral prednisolone in dose of one milligram per kg in tapering doses at discharge. And uh, the neurologist thought to continue levetiracetam, which was continued till date. So. Uh, Following this, so uh, we followed up this patient recently and uh, the steroids were uh, continued and then gradually tapered over a period of month. The anti-epileptics, however, were continued, but since the last three months, since the uh, discharge, the patient had no episodes of seizures. Uh, the patient, there is self-reported improvement in the memory as the patient describes uh, and generally the patient has been uh, generally asymptomatic. So patient is doing well uh, at the follow-up which we saw recently. So. Uh, why we considered a diagnosis of Hashimoto's encephalopathy? Now, of course, there is no gold standard or there's no gold, uh, you know, no, no uh, ironclad uh, diagnostic criteria. However, this is a paper from uh, Zhu et al, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, relatively recent, this is a 2017 paper, uh, who they have described the diagnostic criteria for Hashimoto's encephalopathy, as you can see from this uh, slide here. But the points relevant here is that the patient had episode of encephalopathy with partial or generalized seizures, as we saw in this case. There was presence of high titers of NTTPO antibody. The titers were more than 2,000. And there was exclusion of other neurological conditions, infection, and metabolic disorders. And most importantly, which is very, very important in this patient, is that, you know, we say the proof of the pudding lies in its sweetness, is that this patient's neurological status returned to baseline and there was significant improvement after steroid therapy. So that is how this diagnosis was uh, established in this patient. Uh, I'll just show you two more cases with slightly different presentation. The idea is to show you a spectrum of Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So this is one case, but then there is there are more, uh, the other cases are in fact more conventional and uh, you know uh, more likely to, the diagnosis is more likely to be picked up. So this is a 72 year old female uh, with dementia. And as a part of evaluation at this point of time, the patient was found to be euthyroid. However, the patient had very high titers of NTTPO antibody, uh, which was done, right? Now, this patient was also given glucocorticoids and very interestingly, this patient also had improvement in her dementia, improvement in her neurological uh, uh, situation after giving this uh, giving glucocorticoids. Now, this patient was seen only by the neurologist, uh, you know, they retrospectively referred to us and uh, this is what we uh, really, uh, you know, uh, established from this case. Again, what is very interesting is uh, that Hashimoto's encephalopathy is important because it's one of the treatable causes of dementia and hence, you know, this diagnosis has to be taken into consideration. Uh, it's a rare condition. It's only seen in two cases in one lakh, but I think, you know, at the same time, we need to keep our uh, diagnostic opportunities open and this is another patient who is a 31 year old man with no significant past history he actually initially presented for treatment when he suffered with delusions disorganized speech talkativeness racing thoughts acute episodes of memory loss he needed you know there was reduced sleep uh, irritability since the last four months so this is the clinical presentation there was no alterations found with physical examination or MRI uh, the you know uh, EEG showed intermittent slow wave activity as described 
and uh, we performed the investigations where TSH was again mildly elevated with a value of 5.6, so it's subclinical hypothyroid with normal T3 and T4. But again, the NTTPO antibody was uh, elevated more than 2000. And again, this patient was also on the diagnostic suspicion of Hashimoto's encephalopathy, was given glucocorticoids, leading to significant improvement in the uh, psychosis as well. Uh, you know, uh, and the neurological symptoms uh, and the psychological, the psychiatric symptoms improved after the therapy. So just to kind of quickly review the literature before we uh, go to the discussion. So uh, it was Dr. Russell Bryan uh, who first described the case way back in 1966. Uh, and, you know, uh, he, uh, you can see the uh, original paper from Lancet, which is available. Uh, generally, these patients present with subacute, acute to subacute presentation, and they generally have seizures, myoclonus psychosis and along with that patient may have altered consciousness. Now this is a paper from uh, one of our uh, panelists today, uh, moderators today, uh, Dr. Srinivasa and this is a case a study of uh, 13 patients from Bangalore, uh, Bangalore where they looked at 13 cases of Hashimoto's encephalopathy and they found the most common clinical presentation being cognitive impairment with behavioral changes. There was sleep disturbance seen in about 70%. Uh, there was insomnia or uh, other sleep disorders, fluctuating symptoms. Uh, some cases at psychosis, myoclonus has been also described in other cases. Uh, there were about six patients out of 13 who had seizures. Uh, mainly it was generalized in a uh, few cases. In one case, it was a partial and uh, again tremors in some patients. So, you know, uh, this is the case series from uh, Southern India. And uh, generally, this is seen uh, at an average age of 50 years. However, you know, there's a wide variation in age reported and it's only seen more in females. Uh, uh, there are, you know, two theories. We'll discuss this later. I'll just quickly introduce them. So there is one theory which says that there's an autoimmune encephalomyelitis and the other theory says that it's an autoimmune cerebral vasculitis. Uh, what thing we have to remember is that the thyroid function is not correlated with the uh, severity of the disease or with the disease itself. Patient may be euthyroid or hyperthyroid as we saw in this case or frankly hypothyroid. Uh, there is two ways in which it progresses. In some cases, it, it is a uh, acute to subacute recurrent episodes, uh, whereas in some cases it is found to have a diffuse slow progression with deteriorating consciousness over a period of time. Uh, again, you know, what we need to understand is that seizures can be seen in these cases as we saw in our case and, you know, uh, as we saw from Dr. Srinivas's case series as well. Uh, apart from that, patient can have psychosis and hallucinations, hyperreflexia, myoclonus, tremors, etc. Now, there's one antibody which is specific to Hashimoto's encephalopathy, which is NTNAE antibody, which is N-amino terminal alpha enolase. And this is a specific antibody for Hashi's encephalopathy. Uh, again, you know, uh, hypothyroid is, is not necessarily present. And a lot of patients may have uh, the thyroid function may uh, run an independent course. Uh, again, you know, the important differential you have to keep in mind is that the uh, overt hypothyroidism itself can have, uh, you know, uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations. However, uh, that generally responds well to levothyroxine therapy, whereas Hashimoto's encephalopathy would not respond to levothyroxine, rather it would respond very well to glucocorticoids. Uh, NTTPO antibody is sensitive, but not specific. Uh, it's found in 100% of the cases. Uh, however, you know, uh, uh, it's it does not have correlation with the disease process. Uh, and again, but most cases, the review of literature shows that about the value is about 900 international unit per ml. This is consistent with, again, what is seen with uh, Dr. Srinivasa's case series as well. Uh, but one very important disease you have to rule out here is uh, NT-NMDA receptor encephalitis. This is a paraneoplastic syndrome. And from what I read and from, uh, you know, the cases you have seen, this clinical presentation is very similar to Hashimoto's encephalopathy and this, this is often associated with ovarian can cancers and so on. So this condition has to be ruled out.